Today's episode is brought to you by Herdacity. Herdacity is a nonprofit inspiring confidence in women to achieve their professional goals. For resources, networking opportunities, and a strong community of women, visit herdacity.org to learn more. Welcome to Herdacious, a podcast for audacious women. Salutations to you all. Welcome to Herdacious, the podcast for audacious women looking for a little career support on their journey. My name is Lorelai, and I am thrilled you tuned in today as we're going to be discussing allyship with women and parents in the workplace. And to join me in this excellent, excellent conversation, we have a femme ally, the founder and CEO of Bandwagon, an angel investor for women led companies, and a board member of Women at Austin, Mr. Harold Hughes. Hey there. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you, Harold. I'm so pleased you joined us in this conversation today. It's going to be epic. I'm super excited to talk about this and learn. So I'm really glad to have these kind of conversations. So thanks for having me. My pleasure. I know a little bit about your background, in, and that's why I invited you to this conversation today. So share with us why supporting women in the workplace is an important piece to your professional story. Thanks. For me, it's really simple. I look at this as an opportunity to invest in people who are leading. If you think about the fastest growing startup segment in the country, it is women, specifically Black women in most cases. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> right. So I think about this from an opportunity standpoint of if I'm able to invest in assets that are being underappreciated or overlooked, for me as an investor, I think it's a great opportunity. But also from an allyship standpoint, I'm a son, I'm a brother to sisters. I think about this in context of Not only what would I do for my family members, but that's a really myopic way to look at it because we all have seen how men sometimes only care about the women who are closest to them. I think about the bigger picture being that there's no reason for me not to be doing this and seeing as how many people are ignoring this, I think there's a huge opportunity for men to lend their voices in spaces to make sure we're able to help lift others up. And for me, that's really starting at allyship for women. Harold, why do you choose to support women the way you do, both in your business as well as in your investment portfolio? I think it's a really, really big opportunity. Ultimately, it comes down to the fact that if I'm able to amplify the work of my team members and put them in a position to win, my company is going to be more valuable. We are going to be more productive and we're going to solve more problems. And so when I think about supporting the women on our team and making sure that they're not only getting the education and resources that they need, but also making sure that their work is amplified and that they are justly compensated, I think that it is most obvious for us to find the best ways to return value, not only to our team members, but to our investors. And so as we build our company and as a leader within our team, I want to make sure that we are the best workplace for anyone, especially women, especially parents, especially folks who may feel uh, disenfranchised and marginalized in other spaces. As it relates to investing, I'm just really excited about some of the amazing companies that are being led by women, especially right now in this country's uh, crazy, crazy history. And so I think about the opportunities that I've even had to invest. My first investment, I was given the opportunity by that founder to invest. It wasn't something that I was looking for, but she made sure to create space for me to contribute to her. And now I'm part of her rocket ship. And so as an investor, I think about that constantly saying, you know, it is a privilege for me to serve and be on her cap table. And that's huge to me. Gosh, that's huge to all of us. Give us an example of one of the types of companies that you saw so much promise in that had that female perspective that made it so special and so unique and such a great opportunity for both you as an investor and for the community that it might go to support. The first company that naturally comes to mind is my first ever angel investment, Partake Foods. Partake Foods was started by Denise Woodard, Uh, She is a Black founder. I actually met her in 2017 via the Google for Startups program in Durham, North Carolina. And while most of the companies that were presenting at that accelerator uh, were tech companies, Denise had a CPG company, a consumer product good company, where she basically was selling cookies. And so you'd imagine that amongst all of these other tech companies where you've got AI and VR, that a cookie company may not necessarily stand out. 
But I've learned really, really early on that storytelling is so important. And Denise's story is simply incredible. She is an exceptional career professional that was working at Coca-Cola when her, when she and her husband uh, had their daughter and were surprised to find out that she had a food allergy and do an emergency, had to whisk the daughter away to the emergency room. And like any good mom from there was being super cautious about what she fed her. But from there, she realized like, man, all of the great cookies and snacks and treats the kids love are full of all of the things that her daughter Vivi had allergies for. Oh. And so leaping into it, like most women that I love in my life will do, she leapt in and educated herself on what a solution could be. And she created Partake Foods, a cookie company at the time, to help her daughter as well as other kids all partake of the same snack. She didn't want her kid to have this um, little weird snack that's over to the side while all, everyone else is eating the real birthday cake. And so... Denise built this company and she left her job at Coca-Cola. She was selling these cookies out of her trunk at farmer's markets. She sold her engagement ring. She went all the way in on this. And so as I got to know her as a founder and as a friend, we became peer mentors and I would help her and she would help me. And at one point I randomly said, what's your minimum check size? You know, how much is the least you would take from an investor? And she told me and I said, oh, well, well, I could probably do that. And she really encouraged me to do it. And so since then, she's had an insane amount of success being sold on Whole Foods and Target and uh, all over the place, you know, being backed by Jay-Z. And it's just phenomenal to see not only the work that she's been able to do as an entrepreneur, but as a mom, um, as that person who's taking a leap away from corporate America, like who leaves Coca-Cola uh, to start <laughs> right. this cookie company? And so she's been doing fantastic. And I'm so excited she's allowed me to join her ride. Love that. I mean, you talk about cookie companies. I'm all in. I should have brought some. I, I just, have like a just saying dozen boxes at my house <laughs> at all times. Y'all remember that. Partake Foods. Yes. Why does allyship with women and parents in the workplace matter for companies and for men? I think this really comes down to building an inclusive environment and a product. I think about this when it goes back to the uh, the ketchup example. If you're familiar with it, it's like, where do you keep your ketchup in your house? Where do you keep your ketchup? In the fridge. All right. I would never keep my ketchup in the fridge <gasps> because I'm putting it on hot food. So I keep my ketchup in the cabinet. So what I love about that simple question is the difference of perspectives of each of us. And so you can imagine if you built an entire team of people who only kept their ketchup in the fridge, and then you said, hey, I'm going to send this team into this kitchen. The kitchen's massive. Let's say the kitchen's 10,000 square feet simulated. And we're going to give away money. You have to find the ketchup. And there's dozens of fridges and there's you know, bunches of cabinets. This team of all fridge people would keep searching through all the fridges with no one checking the cabinets. And so I think about that not only from being inclusive and supporting of women, but also from parents. And you think about what's happened, especially in this year, as you navigate the, the pandemic, you know, childcare has been incredibly difficult to come by. And so I think that when you, we start to build solutions for problems and we don't have everyone at the table who may be feeling them in different ways, we miss out on an opportunity to find that solution or find that catch up as it ties back to that previous example. <laughs> I love the ketchup analogy. It's so great. I've never heard that before. Well, on the topic of inclusivity, I frequently hear things like, hey, guys, in a professional setting, even when the majority of folks at the table are female. You got some basic examples like resting bitch face, ice queen, descriptions like cold, too emotional. I mean, we could just go on, right? For sure. How have you adjusted your language to be more inclusive towards women in your personal and professional life? I'm incredibly folksy. You may not, that may not be uh, something that is readily seen about me, but I often will say y'all or folks. Mm -hmm. I don't ever really think I say guys, uh, normally because I try to make sure that I'm not in spaces where it is mostly guys. And I try to make sure that I'm in spaces where I'm including people. One of the biggest challenges I will say that I have is that I'm being more and more aware. My wife, uh, she's getting her PhD at University of Texas, and she's incredibly sharp, um, Howard uh, undergrad and Clemson University Masters. And she's learned so much about gender and identity and all these different things, and she's helping me learn those too. But me growing up in the South, normally saying yes, ma'am, and no, sir, is something that's just built into my rhetoric. Right. And so if I see a person who presents as female or a person who presents as male, 
I may naturally default to a yes, ma'am, or no, sir, not being conscious of what their identity preferences would be or what their pronoun preferences would be. So that's one of the things that I've had to intentionally just kind of really work on my own lexicon, my rhetoric, and say, thank you very much, or I really appreciate that, or no, thank you. Explicitly not adding in those gendered pronouns afterwards or before it. And so that's something that I'm still working at, but it's really, really important for me to say, hey, folks, here's what's going on, or hey, y'all, I hope everyone's doing really good. Uh, That's really how I've kind of uh, guarded against it. But I do think it's really clear about how we communicate with one another, the levels of respect that we show each other, and how intentional we are about uh, the conversations we want those people to be a part of. And so I think that it definitely starts with changing your own language and making sure that you're including people in the conversation that you want to be there. What types of habits did you build out to be more aware and mindful of this specific instance of inclusivity, but any others that you might want to share with us? I take more time when I'm talking. I take an extra second before I press send. I try to think through how the recipient is going to receive my message. One of the things that I learned, I guess it was in college, was about how communication works. And I think growing up, I probably just thought that, you know, if I say all the right things, then I did what I was supposed to. Uh, But I learned that, you know, communication is a two-way street and that the sender does have some responsibility into how the recipient uh, or the listener receives it. And so what I've tried to do is find ways to make sure that I'm being incredibly intentional about the language that I'm using. I edit my conversations down to make sure I'm saying less so that I'm meaning more and saying I don't want to leave much wiggle room for interpretation. Mm -hmm. That part is really, really important to me because I think that when you try to be really flowery with your language and be um, really cute and creative, um, as I say that, I think it's really, really important to say exactly what you mean and be very, very direct about it. And so by taking a second to review what I'm reading, review what I'm writing, and then taking an extra second to then press send, I'm going to minimize the chances for confusion, uh, disrespect, of uh, being offensive, or any of these other things. And so I think that kind of stuff is really something that we've gotten so used to in this culture and my generation is being fast and everything's quick and it's a tweet away and pressing send. I think that if we're able to take a second and slow down, uh, we'll probably reevaluate the ways in which we communicate with one another, the words in which we use, um, and the practices that we can probably change uh, ourselves. Thank you, Harold. We're going to take a quick second for this sponsor break. Hi, Barbie here from Moonray, husband and wife indie pop duo. If you enjoy the intro music, we invite you to listen to our debut EP, Honeymoon, streaming now on all platforms. Visit www.moonray-music.com for more. And we're back talking with Harold Hughes about allyship with women and parents in the workplace. Share with us how male allyship with women took shape for you and what different forms it can look like in the workplace. I think about allyship now and how it's like an actual word. And for me, I think when I was even starting my career, it was really just being a good friend or being a decent human being. Like, I can't imagine sitting next to someone and me being paid more. I will, I remember this story, a woman named Ashley and I were working together at the company I first was hired at out of college. And I negotiated a salary that was $2,000 more than hers. Literally, I was making $32,000 and she was making thirty. dollars And when she found out, she was livid. And it was interesting because she found out because I told her. And that was because I'm very comfortable sharing how much I'm paid, how much people hire me to do things uh, for them. And I think that's really one of the first things that men can do in this conversation is tell women how much you're paid. Be transparent. Be transparent. Share that information. Because I think that uh, growing up, we've always taught like, oh, it's disrespectful or it's rude. Uh, But I think that that structure has kind of allowed us to disenfranchise women and people of color in a way that they have lack of that information and aren't able to make the same decisions that Uh, an educated person with that information would make. So I'll say if Ashley knew that I was making $32,000, she likely wouldn't have accepted an offer for $30,000. And so being transparent about how much you make, I think is one of the first things that I've done as an ally or, you know, person who wants to be um, a supportive part of the entire community. A good human being. 
a good and decent human being. And so I think about that, um, about thinking through how you can share how much you're being paid. That's number one. Number two, I think that it's really important uh, to make sure that you are hiring outside of the spaces that look just like you. As an angel investor, I see lots and lots of uh, investment opportunities, and it blows my mind how many four and five person all male teams that I see. Like, unbelievable. And I think to myself, like, even in 2020, despite everything that's gone on um, throughout the last even few five, you know, five, six, seven years, you would still put together a team of your bros and think like, we're the best equipped team to solve this problem. That's shocking. I mean, the data just doesn't support that. It, yeah. So um, I think that as we look at where we find talent, it's important to find intentional ways to diversify your talent pool. So for example, we just hired a new software engineer. We sent our job rec to, I think, five historically black colleges and universities intentionally before the applicant window opened. We said, hey, we're going to be looking for one person in this department, giving you a two-week head start to kind of corral your people and get them prepared. We also sent it to women's colleges. We also sent them to boot camps and coding schools so that we aren't leaving out people who don't necessarily have a four-year degree. And so I think about those kinds of things that men can do as you're in the hiring position of where are you going to find people? One company that I absolutely love is a company called The Prowess Project, uh, led here by Ashley Connell. And she is making it for women, whether you're a mom or a woman that's coming back into the workplace, to be able to get connected back into the industry in all these different great roles. And we all know that in the midst of a pandemic, unemployment's super high. So companies can be very, very specific about who they want and where they want to get them from. I encourage people to find companies like that and say, we want to make sure that we intentionally are looking at more applicants from many different places that won't necessarily look exactly like our team because that perspective is going to be unique and different. And so I think about being able to build a good team in unique and diverse ways, as well as being able to um, be transparent about what you're being paid is two of the best ways to be an ally as a man in this world right now. Looking for your perspective on this interesting question. What you just shared, is that teachable by women to our male counterparts? Or is that something that has to be peer-to-peer gender specific? So unfortunately, I want to I want to say that it's teachable, but I think that it's kind of going back to what you said earlier, like she's too emotional. One of the things I've learned is that if you are the marginalized group, if you ask for the thing that you should have access to, people will deem it as complaining. Yeah. Even if it is equitable, even if it is equal. Um, and so I think about that oftentimes that I don't think it's women's responsibility, honestly. I think that that responsibility uh, should be held by uh, men. That should be those in that position of privilege. We've had conversations in several of my group chats lately about privilege. And as a Black man in America, there are many people who talk about, you know, we are underprivileged. And we are relative to the white male counterpart, but to our Black women uh, counterparts, we are incredibly privileged. And so I know that I may have a bad day as a Black person, maybe because I'm Black, but I will never have a bad day in these United States as a man. And so I think about the intersectionality of those different points that we really must encourage men to not only fight for their sisters and their wives and their moms or treat them decently, but we have to make sure that we are intentionally, we as men, talking to our friends on the golf course and our friends at the bar are in our fantasy football group chats and saying, hey, that's not cool or that's not acceptable or you're missing out. One of the things I think we've seen from several companies is that they are willing to leave money on the table to not be inclusive. Uh, We saw that in the amount of money that was lost in North Carolina due to the bathroom bill. Mm -hmm. And so we think about this overall in that it's not going to be a dollars and cents thing overall. I also think it's difficult to just simply appeal to the minds and hearts of the oppressive uh, group or the group in power. So I think it's got to be a little bit of both. I think it really has to be men being mindful that the women in your life are not the only women in the world, (laughs) right? And then the second thing is is that it is our job to make sure we're educating um, our male peers on how to be a better uh, and decent person, as you kind of touched on earlier. I think that uh, putting that burden on women is not something that I would want to do. Thank you for that. And to dovetail directly off of what you just said, you know, doing this peer-to-peer education, how has being a father impacted the way you support working parents in the workplace? Because you are having to now teach a new generation of human being how to act. 
Yeah, it is the best thing ever. I grew up as one of five children in my household. My family is uh, Jamaican. And so I was born in the United States. So I'm a Jamaican American, so I identify, but also black. And so my mom, for many years while I was growing up, worked at home. And I say worked at home because being at home, taking care of the kids is hard work. And so there was never a point in my life where I thought like the stay at home mom kind of just had it all and was just (laughs) hanging out. And so that has never been more real for me uh, than during these like last seven or eight months during this pandemic. My wife and I literally broke up our day where she would have my son in the mornings from about nine until one. And then I would have him from about one until five. And then in the evenings, we kind of, you know, share him and split time. And it was really, really difficult. And I think about the number of people who can't work from home and the people who don't have that childcare option. And it was really, really tough. And so being a dad has not only, you know, reinstilled that um, fire that I have to support women who are in these tough situations from a childcare standpoint, but also to make sure that we're looking at resources to kind of help uh, support that, whether that is creating better and more equitable virtual experiences and solutions. So one of the things we do online is a uh, Miss Monica on YouTube and that's circle time. And so that's like 30 minutes a day that my son is like interacting with this teacher and he's learning his shapes and his colors. And I understand that even in that, there's still a big gap because you think about the connectivity issues and so many people in this country, their households don't have that internet connectivity. But I just really think that overall, we've got to find ways to uh, intentionally support the parents in our lives and understand that these challenges that they have are very, very unique. Being open-minded to how they are navigating that challenge is really, really important for us. And so as a dad, I've learned a lot about not only supporting my wife, not only supporting other working moms. And so I'm super excited. One of my proudest accomplishments is the level of compassion that my four-year-old has for human beings, whether he's walking by you and he's wearing his mask and he sees you wearing your mask, or for his mother and the rest of the people in my family. Where are you at on equitable paternal leave? I'm very big on that. I think that the work that many men are doing, one of the ones that jumps out is Serena Williams' husband, Alexis Ohanian, uh, one of the co-founders of Reddit, really pushing that conversation forward. I know that when my son was born in 2016, I took about six weeks. Um, I'm not sure how much I'm not sure how much I can really make myself take off. Like, it's one of those things that I'm really bad at is just simply taking time off. But I do think it should be something that's provided. This idea that you should be at home as a woman, but the man should be out at work. I just think that it's just so backwards. And so um, one of the things I do say uh, to all of my male friends, as well as any, you know, the guys listening, is that your job when your wife, your significant other has that baby is to make sure you take care of her. She's going to make sure you get some time with the baby. Like, you don't have to be in there ready to grab the baby and do things. Those, you know, first couple of months, make sure you're doing an incredible job of being a supportive partner. Make sure that she eats. Make sure she gets a few uh, minutes or an hour to shower and have some time to herself. I think that it's things like that that you wouldn't know if you weren't at home with your significant other and that child. And so when I think about um, you know parental leave, especially as it relates to uh, fathers, I think that that's something we need to make sure we continue to advance the conversation on because not only does it make the workplace better, but it makes the household better. And that's something that I just wouldn't trade for the world. Excellent. What ways do you seek to bring future generations of leaders, all sorts of leaders, to the table around the issue of allyship in general? not just specifically allyship to women or to parents? Sure. I think that in general, I'm not a huge fan of the a rising tide lifts all boats kind of narrative because I think that that idea doesn't control for the fact that uh, some of the boats that are already at a higher position are going to just continue to rise. And so I think about the idea of how do we make sure we provide um, better resources to have more equitable outcomes. I think that oftentimes we get stuck in this conversation around providing equal access or equal resources, but not really even measuring the outcomes. And so I want to make sure that we're improving the equitable outcomes. And for that, I think that the conversation starts with how are you able to make sure it's part of your company ethos to make sure that compensation is equal? How are you able to make sure that you're not only mentoring people who just went to your school? How are you able to make sure that you're not only networking with people who look like you? And so for myself, I try to make sure that I carve out time not only to do uh, these mentoring sessions with founders who are earlier stage than me, but I want to make sure I'm in organizations that allow me to be visible in spaces I might not have been. 
In general, I think the opportunity for allyship across all of these uh, different segments of people is the fact that as you acknowledge your privilege, the more likely you are to want to try and share that. And that's where I think that the conversations can be hugely impactful is if we think through the opportunities that we've received, not just because we were good, but because we were in the right space and because someone looked out for us. One of the things that I love, especially about being an angel investor or even being a job creator, is being someone's yes. And it's even better if you're their first yes. So if you're the person who says, I would like to hire you for this position in the midst of a pandemic, that is a huge yes. If you say, hey, I want to invest $10,000, $25,000 into your company, and I'm writing the check and you know, wish you well, I want to be helpful, but I trust you. That is huge votes of confidence. And I think about that as an opportunity to say, there's a lot that we can do as individual citizens to support not only our friends and family, but also the entrepreneur ecosystem. One of the things that we often talk about is fundraising, and that gets a lot of attention. But I think in general, we should all think about where we fit into the equation. Some people can't afford to be angel investors, so maybe they can be customers. Some people may not be able to be customers because it's a business-to-business type product. But you're a manager, so maybe you can sign on a pilot and help that company get a first bit of revenue. So I think about the ways in which we are all part of this ecosystem. That is where I think is a huge opportunity for allyship is making sure that we're all part of the same conversations, regardless of how loud our voices are, and then making sure we're taking a step back to say, oh, you haven't spoken yet. I want to make sure I create space for you to chat. And so that's really, really important to me across uh, allyship in every form. Lastly, are there any resources that you would like to share with our audience to support effective allyship moving forward? Absolutely. I'm super excited. I'm a board member for Women at Austin uh, based here in Austin, Texas. And Women at Austin's mission really focuses on helping provide resources to women-led companies, make sure they're growing and scaling. And so definitely check out womenataustin.org.org, as well as I'm part of an organization called The Fourth Floor. And that organization is focused on increasing the number of women on board of directors. And we think about this as I think California has recently passed uh, some legislation to require companies to have women on their board, is that this organization got started to try and make sure not only are women being asked to be on these boards, but they're also doing the preparedness side of it. They're also making sure that what training would you need to be an effective board member? And so I think it's really, really cool to be able to support um, that movement because it allows for uh, organizations that may be led by men or may be led by um, any group to make sure they're finding uh, women who can help grow their business. And so super excited to try and plug into those resources. Aside from that, I'm a huge fan of Twitter. Uh, It has allowed me to be transparent about my startup and how we grow and hiring challenges, fundraising and that journey, as well as being able to create real relationships with people. And so I think that um, it's important for us to try and be well-rounded characters online and not just talk only about work or not just only talk about family. I think that people like to work with people that they like. And I think people will get to know you better if you're more transparent about the things you're passionate about. And so social media has been a huge, huge tool for me and my success to this date. And I think about Twitter being the biggest one of those. To be transparent in this moment, just totally dig in the vibe. Thank Thank you you so much, Harold. Awesome. I'm super excited. This has been great. I'm pretty charged up. I kind of want to make sure that you find some opportunities to go support some female-founded companies, um, review those letters of uh, recommendation and those um, resumes, find ways to support this ecosystem. Because I think that what's going to come down to is that the companies that do are going to be the ones that win. And the investors that do are going to be the ones that win. And you don't want to sit aside and let your ignorance or bigotry or any of these things stop you from making these capitalistic returns, if that's your angle. But if you're just a good and decent human being, these are the things we should be doing. And hopefully we're seeing more of that every single day with our interactions with one another. So I'm super excited to be part of this conversation. I appreciate you having me. My pleasure. Now, if you folks are on the internet, as much as I might be, you'll probably discover that it's National Insert Obscure Event Day here. Every day of every month, all year round. November naturally has no shortage of said celebrations. Of course, we have the classics like Thanksgiving. But did you know that November 1st is World Vegan Day? Or November 5th being National Men Make Dinner Day? Hmm. Harold, pay attention. November 1st? November 5th. November 5th. Nailed it. Right? Uh, My personal favorite, Peanut Butter Lovers Month. What? Sweet peanut butter. How I love you. Anyway, 
November 11th is when we celebrate Veterans Day, and we at Herdacious wish to honor our service members who devote and have devoted their lives to uphold America's ideals and to keep our country safe. Today's Fem Fact will be dedicated to the brave women who made their way to the United States Armed Forces and the challenges they faced to get there. Women's service in the United States Army dates all the way back to the Revolutionary War, where they served more traditional and domestic roles such as nurses, seamstresses, and cooks for the male soldiers. The domestic role assigned to women did little to damper their enthusiasm, though, and as we do, women found a way to maximize their purpose in the war effort. Women who were interested in fighting in combat disguised themselves as men to participate in battle. Some even served as undercover spies for the cause. During this time, both genders were paid the same. Amazing. Now, women further progressed in taking the non-traditional roles to serve on the field of combat during the Civil War. When more than 400 women on the record disguised themselves as men and fought, and we have no idea what that total number is overall. Fast forward to 1914, also known as World War I. At this point, women were breaking records for army enrollment, with more than 35,000 American women serving the military during World War I. Those who enrolled ranged in age from as young as 21 to 69 years of age. In fact, due to the large number of women who were being sent overseas during the war, the passage of the 19th Amendment was seriously propelled forward, granting women the right to vote. I mean, if we're fighting for our lives and for our country, the least our country could do was to respect and honor our contributions at the ballot box. Now, in World War II, female pilots began to take the spotlight. The Women's Air Force Service Pilots, or better known as the WASPs, were the first women to fly American military aircraft, forever changing the role of women in aviation. At this point, over 140,000 women were serving in our armed forces, with over 1,000 flying aircraft as WASPs. Now, some other great highlights include 2005, a combat-related Silver Star was awarded to Sergeant Amy Hester, which was the first non-medically related Silver Star awarded to a woman in U.S. history, and it hasn't been the last. In 2013, the Secretary of Defense removed the ban on women to serve in combat positions. 2015, the first two women graduated from the U.S. Army Ranger School. 2016, all combat positions were officially open to include women. In 2017, the first women graduated from the Marine Corps Infantry Officer course, becoming the first female Marine Infantry Officer. And in 2019, the all-male draft was ruled unconstitutional by a federal judge with this case perhaps headed to the Supreme Court. Though women have faced great pushback throughout their inclusion in the military, their persistence and passion to serve in the name of our country has made them a force to be reckoned with and acknowledged. Today, there are over 1.4 million women on active duty, which seems like a hefty number, but only accounts for 14.4% of the United States military. Additionally, 18% of our reservists and National Guard members are female. So this is undeniably great progress. Now, on behalf of Herdacious, we'd like to take this upcoming Veterans Day to pay immense respect and gratitude to all the female service members who display courage, grace, and heroism every day, honoring our nation and defending our liberties. You are real-life Wonder Woman, and we will forever be in awe. Now, Harold, I have been in awe of you today, and I'm so (laughs) grateful for your support of our fellow femmes in the workplace. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Now, if you liked our show, please subscribe and consider sharing this podcast with a friend. You never know who might need a little bit of femme support on their journey forward. Until next time, be brave, take risks, and allow for the unexpected. 